how healthy are your habits? Does your kitchen reflect your best choices when it comes to food? Or does your calendar highlight your priorities, especially those that boost your fitness and energy? If not, my guest today has a bunch of ideas to get you moving in the right direction. This is the 5 a.m. Miracle, episode number 366, Easy Healthy Habits for Busy People with Phoebe Jenkins. Good morning, I am Jeff Sanders, and this is the podcast dedicated to dominating your day before breakfast. And my guest today is a certified personal trainer with extensive training in Ayurveda, anatomy and physiology, and plant-based cooking. She has been in the movement and wellness fields for over eight years and has devoted herself to helping others transform their daily habits. And now here is my interview with Phoebe Jenkins. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Let's just dig right in today with your personal health story. Let's call it that. When did you first realize, I guess, a passion for living in a healthy way? Yeah, early on. So I grew up on a semi-off-grid organic homestead, and I was also homeschooled. Talk about crunchy. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And it was really interesting for me as even as a child, I would go, you know, I did a lot of extracurricular activities and I would go to these events and classes and sports events, whatnot, where other children were interacting with me and I could see how unhealthy they were. One, a lot of them were overweight and I could also see a lot of, of um, unhappiness in them. Uh, like this sense of them feeling unfulfilled or unsatisfied in their childhood. And to me, I was this exuberant, happy, you know, incredibly fit child. And I, in a way, felt bad for these other children. And, you know, it's funny, but at that age, I had this desire to grow up and create a center that kids could come to to learn about being healthy and what it means to be happy and have a fulfilled life. And as a child in that time, I mean... I definitely didn't have any answers, but I had this thought that I could create that somehow. And, you know, that was the first time I really felt that inspiration. And I continued to grow in that sense where, you know, I followed my passion to learn about fitness and nutrition and wellness in all forms. And now working with clients, I'm not working with children, but I feel like I'm still impacting kids through working with with parents and people who could potentially become parents. Yeah, that's excellent. It's great that you were able to figure that out at a young age. I think most people, I guess, this is my childhood. I just assumed that everyone was healthy. I didn't really think about it in a really like clear way until I got older and you know my hormones changed. I gained weight. I was like, wait a minute, something's off here. Uh, so, how have you, I guess, maintained your health as you got older? Because I know a lot of people they hit that adulthood. Their you know their lifestyle changes. What has allowed you to, I guess, to maintain that focus on on a healthy lifestyle? Definitely having it as a number one priority. So it's been something that has always been a priority to me to feel good, to look good, and to do things during my day that I I love. And so every choice I make is based on those priorities. So that's going to determine what I eat, what time I wake up in the day, how I fill my day. While I have successful business, that is not my number one priority. My number one priority is making sure that my body is well, my mind is well, so that I can be productive and efficient within my business, so that I can be productive and efficient within my family, so that I can be productive and efficient within any extracurricular activities I'm doing. And so I maintain that through consistent exercise, consistent uh, mindset, positive mindset, consistent home cooking and eating well. And to me, those things are second nature. It's, it's not something that I have to even think of scheduling in at this point. My life revolves around those things. Those are my ways of life. I think that's unique. I think most people don't share that same perspective. I think that they might view health in a way that's like it's in the way, like their their unhealthiness is like an obstacle, but it's not a priority. I think, what do you think, was it your childhood that allowed you to make sure that was your priority or does your family also follow a similar perspective or why do you think that you have identified that for yourself to be that priority? 
I think a lot of it comes from being a high achiever or an overachiever and slightly competitive (laughs) (laughs) and wanting to, you know, be as productive as I can and feeling firsthand how when I don't eat well or if I don't exercise that that directly impacts my productivity and my ability to think clearly and my ability to make powerful decisions. Uh, And so I don't want to I don't want to do anything that would take away from my ability to be an overachiever. Um, so that's definitely a part of it. I do, you know, there are people in my family who who also live healthy lives, but I'm definitely the person who does that the most. So I wouldn't say that that's the primary motivational source. I, I really think it comes down to, you know, whether it's healthy or not, this drive to be my best self in all forms. And I think a lot of people look at that in the sense of career, particularly well, and to me, I'm not going to be successful in my career unless I'm successful in my health first and foremost. And and maybe that's just my own mindset. And you know whether that's true or not, it's something I believe in. And so that drive is what keeps it as a daily habit for me. Well, yeah. And speaking of drive, you know, one thing people really rely on a lot or assume they need to rely on would be discipline or motivation or this kind of like the emotional, like I have to get up and be like, okay, I have to work out today. Like it's, you know, if I don't do it, things will be bad. It sounds like you have almost like innate, like this, just a desire to do it. So it doesn't feel like it has to be work. Like what do you think that discipline is applied like incorrectly in those cases? Or what would allow someone to be able to get to a point where these kinds of healthy habits do feel second nature? I think a lot of it comes down to this concept that less is more. So, you know, I'll have a lot of clients say exactly what you just said, this, okay, if, you know, if I don't get to the gym for an hour today, I'm a failure or I'm going to be ruining my health. And yes, of course, we need to exercise. We need to exercise consistently. But a lot of that can be achieved from simple hacks or simple tricks like, don't sit all day, use a standing desk, take a 10 minute walk at lunch, have a 20 minute morning or evening routine where maybe you do a little strength training, a little stretching. It doesn't have to be something that takes over life. It can be something that is paired with your life. And and so that's how I approach it. You know, I'm not slaving in the kitchen for hours. I don't have time for that. I don't want to do that, <laughs> frankly. I'm not at the gym for hours. Um, I look at it as something that's integrated within my day and in simple ways, but it's the consistency that maintains the health and maintains my ability to stay fit and think clearly and eat well and move my body. It doesn't feel like a chore. It's just um, this integrated lifestyle. I think that's great. It sounds like it's probably the most effective way to approach I mean, really an yeah, entire healthy lifestyle. So let's picture someone doesn't have this, like, you know, they're struggling with their weight, they're struggling with stress, like things aren't going as well. But like most of my listeners in this podcast, like we're high achievers, we want to get stuff done, we want to be healthy. Like, how do you get yourself from a lifestyle where things are, maybe you're in a rut, maybe you've had some bad habits, how do you shift to where these things are kind of integrated into your life, you know, on an ongoing basis? Totally. So the first thing that I feel is really important is knowing kind of your why or your vision and understanding your motivation behind it. So I have a lot of clients who come in and they're like, I want to make these changes. And when we when we really talk about it, they're wanting to make the changes because they think they should, but not because they actually desire to. And it is totally okay to not want to exercise, to not want to eat more fruits and vegetables, or to really, frankly, not care about your health. That's totally okay, right? That's each person's choice. Uh, So I think it's really important for a person first to determine whether they really want that and then why they really want that. What is their motivation behind it? What is their vision? Because that's super important for any change that a person is going to make is having that, that source of inspiration and motivation. The second thing that I think is really important is to determine any inconsistencies or gaps and any weaknesses and strong points in the current daily habits, the current structure of a person's day. And this can be done through the simple act of keeping a food journal or using a tracking app for seven to 10 days and seeing simple things like, are there times where I'm skipping meals? Are there days where, or stretches of days where I'm not getting any exercise? Do I eat only green foods and I don't get any red or you know purple fruits and vegetables? There can be 
through the simple, Apple, simple act of tracking, there can be uh, so many things illuminated that we might not even know about and that will give us insight of how to make really simple changes that will upgrade our nutrition and fitness. The next step that I think is really important is determining if there's any kind of sensitivities or, or food triggers, and that's specifically relating obviously to food, that is holding a person back. The simple act of eliminating food sens- foods that cause sensitivities or food triggers can incredibly improve a person's health, and that's a simple quick fix. And the other thing that I think is really important is having a really, really solid pantry and routine as far as meal planning and meal prepping. A lot of time I think people envision meal planning and prepping to be something that takes hours in the kitchen multiple times a week to have these perfectly chopped peppers and this perfectly whipped up sauce and it can be that but it also doesn't need to be that. And through the simple act of kind of revamping the pantry, having a really solid uh, and efficient meal planning and prepping routine, people can eat healthy consistently in a matter of, you know, 20 minutes one day and maybe an hour another day. And it's, it's simple and, and satisfactory. Uh, Another thing that I think is really important is for everybody to know what is their go-to 20 minute movement routine. It doesn't need to be more than 20 minutes, but having this sense of what can I do in 20 minutes that my body most needs? What are the, the top kind of compound exercises I can do during that time frame that will hit all the major muscle groups that I need to be working on, especially if, you know, as it relates to the work I'm doing, the career I have, what can I do in those 20 minutes that best suits me and to just have it solid and as a routine that somebody can do consistently without having to flip through exercises on the TV for an hour and waste a bunch of time uh, or spend hours at the gym. And lastly, I'm going to say something else that's really important is being able to create time for self-care. And that, you know, I think happens through having a mindset regarding it, decluttering um, unnecessary tasks and delegating tasks and all the things that you talk about in your podcast and that relate to time management and productivity. That's excellent. I think you covered everything just then. <laughs> so <laughs> I have a couple of questions. I want to dig into a couple of these areas yeah. with more specifics. Um, you hit on, on on having a why, which I think is extremely important. Um, the next yeah. thing, though, was the food journal. Um, this is something that I've never actually done. I've kind of just assumed that I, I know what I'm eating. But I think that you hit on a point there where, like, when you track the specifics, you are you learn a lot about yourself. And so I'm curious as to like, what's the uh, kind of the best way to approach if you wanted to then track your diet, let's say for a week, uh, what would you write down like literally every single bite you took or how does that process work to, uh, to get an accurate record of what you ate? Yes, you hit the nail on the head when you said so many things can be illuminated. A lot of times people will think they're doing extremely well and then they, they keep a food journal and inconsistencies are illuminated. Or they think that they're not doing that great and they keep a food journal and actually they're doing much better than they anticipated. And keeping this kind of food journal, food diary can be done in a couple different ways. The first is very simple, pen, paper. You record, like you said, everything that goes in your mouth. So breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, yes, desserts too, and then also liquids, your waters, your alcohol, your coffee, your teas, your sodas, anything that you are consuming gets written down. And you would definitely want to include the quantities. You know, for somebody who's just starting, it doesn't matter so much if you have the exact weight or the exact grams, but you want to have a general idea. Did you have three sodas? Did you have one banana? Did you have five? You want to write down numbers as well so you have something that's accurate and that is measurable. You would keep that for about seven to 10 consecutive days. Something else that I really encourage my clients to do is record how they feel each day. So, 
you know, a couple hours after breakfast, a couple hours after lunch, a couple hours after dinner to jot down their energy levels, their digestion, whether they're feeling really clear mentally and able to make powerful decisions or not, so that they have a sense when they look back at their food journal, if some days, depending on what they ate, if they felt stronger than other days, and if there might be a link or correspondence of what they're eating to how they're feeling. A second way that they could be uh, keeping track would be through an app. There are so many free apps out there like MyFitnessPal or MyPlate, and that's easy. You know, most of us have our phone with us all the time, and they can also be used on the computer, and you can type in what you ate, how much you drank. You could also put in how much movement you did that day, and it will record and track grams and calories and percentages for you on there as well. So just depends what a person prefers. So I know my, my wife mentioned this before to me that, you know, when she had done this in the past, when she was recording what she was eating, that she caught herself not eating things because she didn't want to have to record that and feel bad about it later. So I think it's interesting that just kind of keeping track of our habits can have an effect on what we're choosing to do. And so from that perspective, let's say that you've gone through this process of seven to 10 days. What do you do with the information afterwards? You mentioned this idea of looking for connections. So like if you identify certain things that didn't work well, do you then just remove those things from your diet or how do you use that data uh, to improve your habits? Yeah, great question. So exactly, you use it to improve your habits. So where there's a, an inconsistency, for example, oh, I'm eating you know, way more fat than the recommended amount or I'm got, not getting my recommended amount of fruits and vegetables per day, then you, you have something you can compare it against, recommended amounts, and you can upgrade or decrease depending. You can also remove foods if you're noticing a trigger or the simple act of saying, oh, I didn't realize I was having a bowl of ice cream every day after dinner, let me cut that back to three times simply because it's common knowledge out there, right? That sugar isn't good for us, junk food isn't good for us, processed foods aren't good for us. It's, that's common knowledge at this point. And most of us are smarter than we give ourselves credit. Like we know what to do. We all know we need to be eating more fruits and vegetables, more whole grains, less processed foods you know, more water, less alcohol, yada, yada, yada. We know these things. And so when we have a clear picture of what we're doing and we know that information, we can start to make the tweaks to get closer to that. So what does a healthy person's kitchen look like? Because I know that one thing I have I've tried in the past is making sure that I have, you know, lots of fresh produce on my counter and in my refrigerator. And I want to make sure like, you know, I walk into my kitchen, I, I feel like I'm in a healthy person's kitchen, but I know there's lots of different kind of, you know, subjective opinions on what that will look like. But what do you think would be kind of some good things we want to look for in a, a really like well stocked kitchen? One thing that I think is undermentioned is having the pantry stocked with staples. And I'll go into that in just a moment. First, I want to say that, yes, of course, having fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, super important, wonderful things to see in anyone's kitchen. When we look at the pantry, we want to see staples. And that means things that are going to be lasting a while. They're generally more dry good and they can be cooked. You know, you you get home from your busy day, you can reach in the pantry, pull out a staple and cook a meal in 20 to 30 minutes. So those kind of staples are going to be things like your quinoa, your amaranth, uh, rice if you're eating grains. They're going to be things like dried fruit and dried nuts, and they're going to look like lentils if you're eating legumes and beans. And then if somebody has an Instant Pot, (laughs) I'm a big fan of the Instant Pot, um, you know, they can come home from a busy day or if they work at home, they get off the computer or whatnot, they can run into the kitchen, uh, they can throw some of those staple items into their Instant Pot, hit go, take a shower, come back out, those have cooked uh, generally in about five to 10 minutes and they have the fresh fruits and vegetables as well. And they can quickly whip up a side of steamed veggies or um, some fresh veggies as a salad. And they're right there, they have a very nutritious, delicious meal that didn't take long at all. The second thing that I think gets under under mentioned are condiments and spices. It's super important to have a wide variety of spices and condiments because one food item can taste extremely different depending on the condiments and the spices that are used. So let me give an example here of, of quinoa. We're all pretty familiar with that. Let's say that you cook a plain pot of quinoa and 
that morning you decide to have it as a slightly sweet porridge and you might put a little cardamom on it or nutmeg or cinnamon, maybe a little dried fruit, dried nuts, maybe some seeds, hemp seeds, chia seeds, things like that. For lunch, maybe you want to turn that into kind of more of a teriyaki uh, stir fry. You saute up some veggies and you have it on the side with the quinoa. And obviously, you know, you don't want to eat quinoa every meal every day, but <laughs> these are just <laughs> examples for you. Um, that night, you could turn it into a stew. You could have kind of a creamy quinoa stew that you add more things like thyme or rosemary to, uh, or you could even do a a coconut quinoa sweet potato curry with turmeric and curry spices. And so, you know, you've one plain staple that you've made in a, in a pot or in your instant pot and you have it in your fridge. And if you have the spices and the condiments, then you can turn that same item into three, four, five different meals that taste extremely different. And that is a time saver and it's a lifesaver because if you know you have that you're less likely to go through the drive through or less likely to um, rely on frozen pizza again that is really creative and really straightforward and one thing that i've been terrible at for the last I don't know, 20 years of my life is being creative in the kitchen I, I'm, I get really stuck in ruts and i really like how you're able to you know, take something like quinoa and make it so much more interesting um, i think that's really in terms of productivity and time saving that's obviously going to be huge but also just the creative you know a variety you'd have with your food um, let's say somebody you know is a busy person their kitchen's not as healthy as they want it to be do you make a, a slow transition to be healthier or do you recommend just like gutting your whole pantry and starting over again with a whole new slew of food? Like how does somebody make a shift to ensure that their kitchen uh, is going to get them to that healthy place in a way that they can then, I guess, sustain long term? There are two ways I go about that. The first is just go for it. Pantry revamp. Take out the things you know no longer serve you. Refill it with the things that do serve you. Stock it up with the staples get yourself set up with the fresh fruits, fresh, fresh veggies, et cetera, et cetera. That is something that I feel like works well when a person has a lot of support. A person has a guide so that they don't, they don't fill their pantry with new things and their fridge with new things. And then the next day say, oh my gosh, how do I use all this stuff? And then the next thing they know, everything has wilted or rotted or um, gone bad in some way and it's been a waste of money and a waste of time. And that can happen frequently. So if a person is not having guidance, not having mentorship, then I would say it's a slow transition and that's gonna be more beneficial. And that's the act that I call of crowding out. So instead of depriving yourself, instead of taking everything away, you think each week, what is one healthy thing I can add in? And eventually that one item per week is gonna crowd out all the other things and it will make the transition happen without it feeling like a chore. Yeah, that's great. I, I've always loved the idea of just adding in more healthy options. I think that gives you like a common example. Of like when I walk into my kitchen, you know, I tend to lean towards just grabbing the most convenient thing. And if that convenient thing is a stack of bananas, that's a lot better choice than other things I could grab. And so I feel like that just, yeah, the idea of having healthy things around and having more of them, you know, it definitely leads to just healthier choices, even in, in the spur of the moment of those impulses when we're making, you know, less than ideal choices most of the time. Agreed. And you know, what is visible is what we will reach for. And it's, that's just human nature. And so one of the best things a person can do in their kitchen is hide the things they don't want, or even better yet, just not buy them. And in that place, put the things they do want to be eating. Like you said, so that you can reach for that banana simply because you see it. And that's how our brain works, right? Definitely, definitely. Um, there was one thing you mentioned earlier, which is being uh, sensitive to certain types of foods. You know, I, I know in the past, like I have seen GI doctors for other issues that I had personally, and I've recently, my wife and I actually bought some tests. Uh, there, it's a blood test that you run at home uh, to find out what you're sensitive to. We haven't actually done this test yet, though, so I'm curious to try this out. But how how do you think is a good way to identify uh, what foods your body is reacting to in a bad way that you may not even be aware of? So what you mentioned, the, the tests are a great way to go. However, if a person wants to do kind of a home experiment, 
they could do an elimination experiment. And this would mean that for about two weeks, they take out the common food allergens or the common foods that might cause a sensitivity. And that's going to be your wheat, your gluten, your dairy. Um, that's going to be things like eggs and peanuts. That can also be things like certain vinegars or yeast. And there's kind of a, a list of about five items that you would remove for those two weeks completely. And then after the end of those two weeks, you add one item back in. So let's say at the end of the two weeks, you add back in dairy. You eat some cheese or you drink some milk and you, you don't add any other items back in and you simply observe for the next three days how your body feels. Do you have indigestion? Do you suddenly get the stiffles? And, and so this takes a lot of definitely introspection and it does take some writing down, some tracking, some evaluation. But some people will notice that after they take something out of their diet for two weeks, the simple act of, say, eating some cheese again, immediately they might have, uh, you know, to excuse TMI, but they might have diarrhea or they might suddenly have abdominal cramping. And that's information. That is really important information. And now they can make a choice. Do they want to explore more testing? Do they want to keep that in their diet and know that it could be causing some of the discomfort or sensitivities that they feel? Or do they want to take it out of their diet for a longer term for six weeks and see what impact that makes? They do this with each food item. So after the three days where they tried the dairy, then they would add in, let's say, the wheat. Same thing, they eat a sandwich or a piece of bread, whatnot. They wait three days, track and observe any information that their body gives them. And they do this with each item that they have eliminated. And so it's this kind of self, um, again, self data gathering, kind of like the food tracking. Now we've just taken it a little bit deeper. Yeah, that's a really good process. And it's definitely one that would give you a lot of information as far as you know, adding that thing back in and then being aware of your body. I think that you're bringing a good point here, which a lot of this has to do with just self-awareness and knowing kind of what you're putting in your body, how your body responds to it, and then having the intentionality of making the change because of that, which I think is goes back to your kind of original point of saying that, you know, healthy lifestyles is kind of an, it's an intentional priority. Like this is how you live. And so you want to, if you want to change these things, you have to be aware of these things and then be able to consciously, you know, make those changes for the better. Definitely agreed. 100% awareness is, is key to making progress in anything. So one question that I always ask my guests on the show has to do with their own kind of healthy habits or at least their own morning routine. So I'd love to hear, you know, if you have kind of an ideal morning, what kinds of habits are you including? What kinds of priorities do you set for yourself? Uh, what does a really good day look like for you? I'd love to share my morning routine, my miracle morning. Um, so generally I wake up around 5, 5.30 and I start the morning with a little bit of skincare, a little two-minute exfoliant scrub because that feels good. It wakes me up, some cold water on the face. Next, I do some journaling, which involves gratitude writing, prioritizing for my day, the most important work tasks I need to do. I also write down the things I need to do for fun, for adventure, for self-care. I prioritize those just along right there with my work tasks uh, and any other type of writing that I need to do regarding, you know, clients I need to follow up with, leads I need to follow up with, whatnot. Next, generally, I will either do movement or cook. And that kind of depends on what the rest of my afternoon looks like. If I have some free time in the afternoon later, I will cook in the morning and choose to, to do exercise in the afternoon. Uh, if my afternoon is busier, I will tend to exercise in the morning because my freezer is generally always stocked with some healthy meals and I usually have food in my fridge so I can get away with not cooking every single day very easily. Um, so I'll either spend time cooking my dinner for the evening and that's you know about 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m. or I am exercising and then at that point, once that's complete, I'm eating breakfast, I am getting myself ready, you know, getting dressed, getting my mindset in place, listening to an audiobook at times during that process, and then launching into work um, by 8. So you're preparing your dinner at 6 a.m., is that what you said? Yep. <laughs> That's, uh, I find that to be highly unusual and also extremely productive. Um, can you walk us through that process a little bit more? Because I feel like that's uh, something that somebody could really gra gravitate towards. 
That process is just the same as if I were to cook it in the evening. I, you know, I have what's called a recipe bank. So I always have recipes on hand that I can grab one and go to. And I always have generally my fridge stocked. So same thing, just like in the evening, I am popping into my kitchen. I might, you know, have a smoothie made. So I'm sipping on a breakfast smoothie at the same time, but I'm chopping foods, baking, getting everything ready. I'm also in the process at times of maybe prepping snacks for the day and I will cook my entire meal and either pop it in the fridge or leave it on the counter. And, you know, my family can pop it in the fridge later. And then once it is time to eat dinner, I can pull it out, reheat it quickly in the oven or on the stovetop. And that way, when it is dinner time, I'm not gonna be stuck in the kitchen. I can actually, instead after work, do a hobby. I can work on a guitar song. I can um, go for a walk with my family and I'm not worried about having to be in the kitchen after already working all day. Yeah, that's great. I think that's a super effective way to get your time organized. You have to free up time later in the day, which is such a, you know, that's usually a really stressful time. It's busy. You come home from work and there's a lot going on. So, yeah, I love that that is, you know, you've pre-thought that out in a way that frees up time. But also, of course, because you're being intentional with what you're eating, probably is you're preparing a healthier meal than you would have if you're trying to rush one at the last minute. So that seems like that's something I think a lot of listeners could really uh, utilize soon. Definitely. Yeah. In the morning, I'm generally making healthier decisions. <laughs> I'm, I'm faster as well. I'm less distracted. I'm not stuck on phone calls or social media or feeling down about things that already happened in my day. So I'm just up, make the food, get it done next. That's perfect. Um, this has been great today. We've, I, I've learned a lot. I'm sure listeners have as well. And I want to, uh, of course, tell them you know, where they can learn more from you and how they can dig in further um, if they want to you know, improve their own diet in, in a bigger way. Yes, it has been so fun to share all this information with you as well. And I can be found on my website, phoebejenkins.com. I also am extremely active on YouTube, Phoebe Jenkins there as well, and on Facebook and Instagram. Again, you can find me as Phoebe Jenkins on both of those. And on those, I'm sharing recipes, cooking videos. I'm sharing also yoga videos and fitness videos since I'm also a yoga teacher and a personal trainer. And um, a lot of it is very real. You know, I'm, I'm not in some fancy kitchen with the most <laughs> expensive equipment. This is just like, hey, here's how a busy person uh, can have a healthy lifestyle in, in the most real way. My hair doesn't always look perfect. Yours won't either. Let's do it. I love that. Yeah. Being really authentic. That's perfect. That's mm -hmm. also very relatable. That's, that's a great thing. Oh, well, this has been great. Yeah. I'll have all those links for our listeners this week in the show notes page. But uh, Phoebe, uh, thanks again. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Jeff. It was great to be here. And for that great action step this week, restock your kitchen. You know, one of the easiest and most effective ways to improve your healthy habits is to restock your kitchen with healthy foods. So when you're tempted to stray from your plan, your kitchen will remind you what to focus on at every single meal. And of course, go learn from Phoebe about how you can implement even more healthy habits by going to her website at phoebejenkins.com. And of course, the show notes page this week is jeffsanders.com slash 366 for all the links discussed today. That's all I've got for you here on the show this week. And until next time, you have the power to change your life. And the fun begins bright and early.